unless you go to a race, you truly don't understand how great it is. You have to go and watch the speed and the precision and just how exciting it is. And um, I, I absolutely love it. Welcome to Kevin Harvick's Happy Hour, presented by NASCAR on Fox. We encourage you to follow us on YouTube or at Harvick Happy Pod anywhere on social media and anywhere else that you take in your podcast. And today we've got um, Joe Girardi, a former uh, baseball manager, and now on the Yes Network uh, doing television uh, like I am. And what was uh, probably one of the best influences uh, on, on my re- retirement decision uh, gave me some, some great advice along the way. We've had some great conversations. And thanks for joining us today, Joe. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're, um, you know, I, I tell people all the time that, that uh, the same things that you told me, I've, I've had a, a couple of drivers ask me a, a, along the way about the, the advice of, of how you knew it was, was time to, uh, to get out of the car. And, and uh, you, you told me to make sure that I, I took that Jersey off when, when I felt like it was right. And, and to, um, that, that I would just know. And, and I, I just thank you so much for all the, the time that you, that you spent to be able to give that advice. And, and that last year for, for me was, was something special and, and to be able to get out of that race car, and not have to tell somebody, have somebody tell you that um, you have to get out of that race car, and then not being able to to come back and, and find a job was probably one of the most rewarding things that I ever did in my career because I felt like I felt like I had finally made it. I was able to start uh, my career and end it on on my own terms. So um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. I mean, obviously, it's always hard to take our uniforms off, and yours decisions a little bit tougher than mine was because I think it's really evident when you can't play. I mean, you were still racing at a high level, but you know, you knew when it was time and now you're doing something great. And the great thing about broadcasting is we're not so invested in who wins or loses. Uh, We just get to enjoy it and talk about the things that we love. How has that been for you to, to go from playing to managing the team to, to, um, you know, in that dugout on a weekly basis, and now you're sitting up top. And, and what's, that, what's that like for you to be able to do the broadcast? I know you've done it for, for several years in, in different situations, but now you're, you're back on the S yes Network. You're, you're watching the, the games every week and doing the things that you're doing. What's the, what, what's the difference from, from being player coach to um, sitting in the booth and, and watching the games for you? Well, the game is much slower. Um, when you're watching it up top than when you're watching it from the dugout, because I'm, when I'm watching it up top and broadcasting, I don't need to make decisions. Um, like, do I need to get this pitcher, pitcher ready? Do I need to get a pinch hitter ready? You know, do I need to steal? Do I need to hit and run? I don't have to worry about those things. I have to talk about what I see, you know, and, and you try to first guess, not second guess. Cause I think it's, you know, managers have a ton of information to them. And they make it the decision based on the information, but there's the human element and the guy that's across from you that's competing against you. So it doesn't always go right. Um, the moves that you make, but I, I, I really like it. It's, it's much slower up there. There's a lot less pressure up there. And you know, the, the greatest thing about broadcasting, you know, in between being a player and a manager is you're part of a team still. And I think, you know, for athletes, when we get out of what we do, whether it's for you driving, you were part of a big team. Uh, For me, playing and managing, I was part of a big team. You get to be part of a team again, and I think that's special to us. Well, that's been one of the things that that I've enjoyed the most, and we've actually got some people that used to be on the uh, uh, Fox baseball team, and and they they said, you know, the thing that I love about Coach Girardi the most was he would shake everybody's hands, he knew everybody's names, and for, for, for me as well, that, that has been a, a great part of, of what we do in the, on the broadcast side is, is to get to know new people and learn new processes. And, but there are still pieces about racing that, that I look down and, and say, well, that was really exciting, but I don't really miss any of it. Is, are there any, is there anything that you miss? What's the thing that you miss the most about the competition or uh, coaching the team or anything like that, that you say, well, that, that was, that was the part that I missed uh, sitting up here in the booth. 
I don't miss playing one bit. I, I really don't. I, I feel so much better that I'm not playing physically um, than when I was catching every day. You know, you have to find ways to go to sleep where you were comfortable, where your back didn't hurt. I, I, I don't miss that one bit. I do mm-hmm. miss managing. I do miss the relationships with, you know, my coaches, the players, and all the people in the organization. I do miss the strategy, but I'm happy with what I'm doing. And if I get a chance, that would be great. And if I don't, that's great too, because I really love what I'm doing with the broadcasting. I'm going to be 60 years old and, you know, schedules are tough, but I love it. How's the game changed? We, we, we look at, at what we do in the garage and, and all the analytics and all the engineers and, um, you know, the, the races are plotted out before the, the game, the, the race even starts. Tell us how baseball has changed in, on that side of things from when you coached or even when you played uh, to, to where it is today, because it seems like it's very similar on the baseball side as, as to how you look at all those analytics and the, and the decisions that you make. Well, the first thing that always stands out to me is the size of the players, how big they are. Um, I mean, I'd be considered really tiny right now um, as a baseball mm-hmm. player. You see shortstops that are 6'3", 6'6", where they were always guys that were 5'10 to 6'1". And, and I've noticed, you know, I look at Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge is like a mountain of a man. I mean, it's a defensive end playing center field that, that moves really well. And so many players are so much bigger. Pitchers are bigger. Um, I also think the analytics and the information that's available to us allows us to dissect the game, dissect players, make decisions about players, but also create repertoire for pitchers that that help them. You get instant feedback where we, a lot of times you had to wait to see what the hitter did, but you have cameras on you. You have spin rates that you can measure just from your bullpens and you get instant feedback. And I think that's really helped players. Analytically, they're so much farther ahead than when I played, and we used analytics um, somewhat, but now there's so much information. Um, you know, it helps the players with their swing pass and everything that they do, how they run. Um, it's it's amazing. So when when you were when you were coaching and you and you had all the information, so now do you think that the the coaches can make the same decision, or are there more people involved in in making that decision because? I would assume as a coach, you would go off of, of your gut reaction as to sometimes when a pitcher needs to come out or when you need to put somebody else in or change the batter or uh, what, whatever this case is. Do you think that, is it just the coach involved now or are there more decisions than, than just the coach? No, I think they're giving a ton of information now. And the thing about analytics is that it takes the emotion out of the decision um, is the one thing it does. And over time, it's supposed to work. But I think as a manager, sometimes you have to make a decision based on what's available that day, not necessarily what analytically you would do, or sometimes how the player's going. I think you have to, to you can't forget that there's a heartbeat inside and there's a brain inside that sometimes it's at the top of the game and sometimes it's not. So I think you have to use all the information that's given to you and your gut feeling about the player that day. and. I think that's really important. But again, the analytics helps you make better decisions. Um, For the most part, they're going to be right most of the time. But the other thing about analytics is you get, you have to remember the other team has them too. (laughs) And the other team, you know, sets up their matchups as well, and they're paid to beat you. So just because you make a decision analytically and it, and it works in a little piece of paper on a box, it's not always going to work in the game. Yeah. And the game has, has definitely changed. And, and for, for me as a spectator sitting and and watching the game, especially in person, the pace of the game is, I'm a fan of, of shortening the games and and doing the things that they've done with the, with the clock. And, and I think from a player standpoint and a manager standpoint and a team standpoint, that may be debatable, but from a fan standpoint, I love the pace of, of the new game. What is your opinion of that? Um, you know, of, of the clock and the pitchers and the injuries and everything that we hear about this conversation outside of, outside of the, the players and, and what they think. What's your opinion? I like it. You know, from a player standpoint, it's probably like playing 20 less games from a time schedule. And, and that's substantial. When you're playing 162 games a year, you're playing 30 or so in spring training. 
you're reducing your time on your feet and it's less wear and tear on your body. And it, it might lengthen your career or help you be more successful in the months of August and September when you're really, really tired and you've been through a rough season. As far as the injuries, the injuries were happening before the clock at, at an alarming rate for me. And I think it's partly because of the size of the players, the max effort that they're using, all the training that they're doing, trying to increase everything, their flexibility, their strength. You know, I, I'm not sure a body's meant to handle it. And especially when you talk about pitchers, and those seem to be the players that are getting hurt the most, uh, the arm is meant to be thrown like a softball, you know, underhand. It's not meant to go overhand. Um, that's not how our body was designed. And when you start putting the torque and the strength, sometimes, to me, the body just can't handle it. And it's why you see all the injuries. Thank God, though, we have wonderful surgeons that get players back on the field, and they come, times, come back sometimes bigger, better, and stronger. But I think you're going to continue to see them. And I think everyone's trying to get so much movement on the ball. The torque that they put on their pitches is going to cause some problems. It's just something we're going to have to live with. So, so how do you think our buddy Gene Monahan would deal with all this? Would he, would he agree with, would he agree with you on that? Would, would he say, yeah, uh, Gene Monahan, Gene? So I think, I think Gene, uh, just to explain to everybody, Gene Monahan, former trainer of the of the New York Yankees, he was a, a good friend of of mine, and and actually is the one who introduced us. But Gene is a is a huge race fan. I I believe he probably turned you into a race fan as well. But yeah, he did. Um, yeah, and and I think. Um, the first game that we took Gene back to, I said, "Let's Gene, let's go up and 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 watch the the Yankees game." And he took his little his little uh, bag up with him. And about three innings into the game, I lost Gene. He was back in the dugout working working on the players. Um, but you know, I think from a, from the from the training room standpoint, it seems like the 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 that has changed throughout the years as to how you approach the body. The amount of games that you guys play on a, on a baseball schedule, I think our schedule is long. How do you keep up? How do the players keep up with their bodies? I know it's obviously way different than than the way that you would do that. But on the road, is is there a regiment? I mean, you can't just go out and you know throw the ball around every day. You, you talk about the you know the flexibility and and the strength and and so how do you manage that with making sure that you have enough rest throughout the season? Well, sometimes it's hard to rest because you'll play a game you know, on the West coast and you'll fly back and get into New York at, you know, seven, eight o'clock in the morning. And then you, you have that day off, but it just, it really, it's difficult. You play Sunday night baseball and you get into the next town at 4 AM and you're playing the next day. But I think baseball has done a really good job of focusing on recovery, um, learning more and more techniques. I think they have more trainers today than we ever had. When I was a player, there were two trainers. A lot of clubs will have four trainers and they'll have, massage therapists. And there's so much um, emphasis on recovery because they understand that's how you keep players healthy. They're doing a real good job. I mean, there's sleep pods in clubhouses. Um, we never had that. You, you kind of fell asleep maybe on the couch in front of the TV a, a little bit. But I, I think the training has gotten better. And I, and I think they, you know, they've also, with all the analytics that we have and the slow motion cameras, they realize that sometimes what they're asking a player to do, his body just won't do it. And I think that's really important because I think if you're trying to do something, your body just doesn't allow you to do, you're eventually going to have injury. And I think they've done a really good job of setting baselines on players of what they can do and what they can do and what they can't do. You know, they, they try to move slowly to see if they can get more flexibility or you may have a, you know, a left hip that doesn't move the same as the right hip. How do we get a balance there? If you get a balance, there's probably less chance of an injury. They've done a really good job with those type of things. Who's the best player right now? Otani, Trout, Judge, Acuna. Who, who do you think's the best player right now? Well, I think you have to say Otani because he pitches. He, he does both. I mean, he's a top-notch DH and he's a top-notch pitcher. The number one offensive player in the game you know, if I was to look at it, I, I think it would be Acuna Jr. because of what he's able to do on the base pass. And he's a very good defender as well. Uh, I, I think you'd have to put Aaron Judge in that because of what he physically is able to do. You know, he's able to hit 50 home runs every year, driving runs. He takes his walks. He plays center field. Uh, but I think it would have to be Otani because he's a two-way player. So you you mentioned Aaron Judge, and I think it's a, it's a really – 
interesting time for for the Yankees not having won a World Series. You got a star player with with Aaron Judge. How do you compare Aaron Judge as the leader to where let's just say a Derek Jeter was at this particular time? Is is he the is I mean obviously he's the he's the true leader of the team, but how would you compare the the styles of those two because they seem different to me? Yeah, I would say it's pretty similar. I don't have a ton of information on how Aaron Judge leads. I had him for like a year and a half. But they're kind of quiet leaders in a sense where they're going to talk to players individually. They're never going to embarrass players. They're always going to act like they're their big brother. I mean, Aaron Judge, they used to love to watch him because he would wait on the corner of the dugout until everyone got in the dugout, and then he would go down the stairs. And I was like, man, that's like the big brother protecting everyone. Mm-hmm. And he's big enough to do that at 6'7", 275, 280. But th- th- they're kind of similar. They both play very hard. They're both very prepared. They're both all about winning. But it's more of a not-in-your-face type of leadership, more of a loving leadership, and I think they're pretty similar, actually. Who's the best player you ever coached? Ooh, the best player I ever coached. That's a great question. Um, Because I've had some good ones. I've had Jeet. I've had A-Rod. I've had Mariano Rivera. um, I've had Bryce Harper. uh, It's Miguel Cabrera. Um, It's it's hard to say. I would say you could look at all those guys and say you could make a case about each one of them. Um, Miguel Cabrera is the only guy that I ever managed that won the Triple Crown, which is an amazing feat. Hmm. So you 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 spent a lot of time in New York, and you know we we had a our powerhouse team, one of our powerhouse teams in, in Hendrick Motorsports, win uh, in their 40th anniversary this week they of of their first race, um, and you know you hear all the chatter about you know this or that and what makes the team great. What's what makes the what explain to me the Yankees mystique? I know you've played for for different teams, you've coached in different places, and you know been all around the the baseball world. And and you know Hendrick Motorsports for us has this mystique about what they do and how they always win and how they always find their way back to the front. Explain that to the racing world as to what it's like to live in that as a Yankee, as a Yankees coach, or as he, as a player, whatever that is, and, and why it's different than everywhere else? I think it's great because you know, first of all, every year that you walk through the doors in spring training, you have a great chance to win. So that's exciting. When, you know, I, I managed the Marlins, my first team I managed, and the, and the team was dismantled. And people asked me, you know, what my goal was. Was it not to lose 100 games? I'm thinking, what? I mean, I, I come from the Yankees. I mean, we're expected to win the World Series. And I said, you know, our goal is to win the World Series. And if we don't get there, that means we fell short. We got to find a way to get better. But I think the, the great thing about being a, being a Yankee and having that opportunity is you're going to have everything that you need to be successful. And they're going to do everything they can to help you. And they're going to put you in great spots to to be successful. But you also have to understand that if you don't do it, th- there's a consequence to that. And, and that's okay. I mean, that's sports. And I think the biggest thing about being a Yankee is embracing the expectations and understanding you're actually really fortunate that people are that passionate about it and that the organization is willing to give you whatever it takes to win. You have to embrace that. And Joe Torrey had a great line. He said, New York will either make you or break you. Some players couldn't handle it. Some players just weren't meant to be in that type of environment. But a lot of players are, and it's really enjoyable. But you know when you walk through the, you know, those doors, there's 27 championships, the players and the Hall of Famers that have come before you. You see them all in spring training. Like every spring training, you know, Yogi would be there when I was the manager. And you're like, wow, I'm I'm in the presence of greatness. I remember seeing other great, you know, like Goose Gossage, and you just saw a, a ton of awesome players. Now guys like Bernie Williams are coming back, and Tino Martinez. These are guys that were part of that, you know, four championships, the three in a row. And and there's just an expectation, and I learned to love it. Like a lot of people like, well, isn't it hard being under that scrutiny and having to deal with the media? No. You just know that it's part of your day. You prepare for it, and you make sure that, you know, you're protective of your team. And you go out and win. And when you win, there's no place like it. 
Yeah. And wh- what do you think's kept them from winning the World Series over the last several years? What What's that piece that, that's missing? I, I, I think there's a couple of things. I think it's gotten harder. The more playoff teams that you add, I think the harder it gets because you have a better chance of having an off series. And I think their biggest downfall is they haven't been able to stay healthy. Um, mm. They that The injury bug has really hurt them. And, you know, you think about it, they lost their leadoff hitter and their ace to start the season, Garrett Cole, and they're eight and two. So they're overcoming it. So, but you can only have so many injuries that you can overcome. And right now they're doing a really good job of it. Yeah. And, and you know, it just seems like, I mean, obviously everything that, that happened in, in 2017 and, and has led to this year. And, and I think as you go back to that, that moment with the Astros and, and everything that it changed and affected in the sport, it just seems like, I mean, you tell me what you think the ripple effect was from that particular point to where we are today, because I'd be, I'd, I'd miss, I'd probably miss, be misspeaking if I, if I gave a hundred percent of my opinion, but tell us from your standpoint, everything that that has affected, because when you look at the stats and everything that, that happened from that time period, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a big, um, a big topic of, of, of debate, I guess you could, you could say, but tell me what you think the ripple effect just for the Yankees in general has been from, from that particular point. Yeah, I think it's been hard. Um, but you know, it was a chance that maybe we had a, an opportunity to go to the world series. Um, we won the three games at home. We lost all four on the road. Um, but you know, Kevin, stuff like that has been going on forever. Maybe not at that level and using, you know, TVs and uh, electronics. But I mean, when you're playing at such a competitive level, you understand that you have to protect everything, all your signs, um, all your information as much as possible, because everyone's always looking for an edge. I mean, that's the bottom line. And it's in every sport. I mean, we saw what happened in college football and it's going to make the game better because they're going to start using the headsets that they use in the NFL. Basically, you know, the speaker is going to be in, in the quarterback's ear and they're going to be able to give the plays. So that stuff can't happen. I think it just improves the game. And I, and I think, you know, baseball has done a really good job with using pitch com. And, and I got to tell you, Kevin, during the whole course of a game, I always watch the runners on second. Um, when we were on defense and I watched the coaches in, in the boxes to see if they were giving location or they were giving the pitch, I'd be really happy that I didn't have to do that now. Um, <laughs> that, that would make my job easier. So, yeah. and, and always telling our, our catcher to change signs, right? A lot of times that's why catchers would go to the mound because we had to change signs all the time. So you would have so many on you and some pitchers were we're better at remembering difficult signs than others. So some of you had to make it kind of easy, man. I think this has just made our game better and, um, and I'm happy. So I know, I know that you're, you're a race fan. Uh, you, you've obviously yes. uh, been around for, for a while. Tell me how you became a race fan. Your first okay. interaction, um, at the racetrack, your first race that you attended. So Gene Monahan, who's we, we talked about early, got me into racing. And, and when I was a player and Joe Torrey was a manager, Joe Torrey teamed up with um, Stevie Donahue, the assistant trainer, and they called their team was Pits and Chips, and it was Monahan Racing. And my name was Bootleg Racing, and Charlie Wanswitz, our video guy, uh, was Wands Racing. And what we did is we had to pick one driver from each tier the top 14, then the next 14, and it used to be 42, I believe, and then the bottom 14. I know the numbers have changed. And you took your total score, and the total score you won, and we kept points the whole year. And at the end of the year, Gino would give the points leader um, a, a little die-cast car on a plaque with a championship trophy, basically. And Gino would write news and notes every week. He would rip us. He would, you know, he was the commissioner, and We'd always go to him with some of our complaints, and he'd always say, <laughs> duly noted but denied is what he would always say, right? So I really got into it, and and Gene took me to my first race in Rockingham, North Carolina. That was the first race. And then I continued to go with him a few every year, and I remember going down to Homestead. I remember going to the Daytona 500 with Gene, and we got up early that morning and drove over. And the race is about to start and jeans walking right down between the cars and i'm thinking 
are we going to get in trouble? Shouldn't we like get behind, you know, the wall and, you know, these guys got the car, car started, but everyone loved Gene and Gene just kind of did what Gene wanted to do. And I, I've fallen in love with it. And I, and I tell everyone, unless you go to a race, you truly don't understand how great it is. You have to go and watch the speed and the precision and just how exciting it is. And, um, I, I absolutely love it. Um, I always have it on and, and I'm doing things. And I mean, I was listening to the, the story about um, the clock yesterday and how many people's houses it's moved to and where it is. And, um, you know, yours got put in the basement, I guess, but um, the yeah. grandfather clock, but it was just well, it, it's, really, it's got to wind up on the set here shortly. It's got to wind up on the set. I right. promised them I would bring it to the set because it sits in the garage. So uh, my wife said it didn't match the, didn't match the decor in the, in the house, but I was adamant that there's no way that the grandfather clock can't be in the house somewhere. So, uh, I, I lost that battle, but I, I, I had a small victory by, by keeping it in the garage. So, um, have you picked a favorite driver? Is there somebody that you, that you like in, in, in the current NASCAR field? Who, who would be your favorite driver? Well, my favorite driver is retired. Um, so I, I, I'm learning to, to like, you know, the, the new drivers, because so many of the guys I cheered for are, are, are retired and, and that happens. But, you know, I, I like Denny Hamlin, you know, he's always in the mix, no matter what. And um, that's exciting to me because that that's a champion, a guy that's always in the mix. But there's so many good young drivers now that I, I just need to get to know. You know, I, I didn't really have to root for anyone else because I used to root for Kevin Harvick all the time. But now I got to find a new love. Well, you know, I, I appreciated that. And, and I think it's, I tell, I tell fans all the time, I, there's a lot of great personalities. A lot of them haven't, haven't come out of their shell yet to, to show us uh, all of their personalities. And I, I think that is, that is definitely something that, that, uh, that they all need to work on. But um, our pit road has been overrun with, with professional athletes of, of guys that didn't quite make the cut, whether it be, in baseball or the NFL. And, and I think that is, that is something that is pretty intriguing, uh, to, to me that, that gets overlooked and, and maybe you don't have to become a, a fan of a driver. You can, we're, we're trying to get the, the pit crew guys, uh, more out there, but, uh, Denny Hamlin is, that's going to be, that's going to be an interesting clip that gets, that gets, uh, advertised on this show because, uh, Denny has a lot of very passionate fans that, that, uh, that, that root against him. So before I let you go, I need to know what was your first car? What did you drive and how did you stop driving it? Did you sell it, wreck it? How did it end? Okay, my first card was a Ford Red Tempo that I bought myself um, from a paper route and I had a German Shepherd that I bred and I raised money to buy a car so I could go out to the Cape Cod and ha play baseball and have it in college. And then the next car I bought was Part of my signing bonus, um, it was a it was a Ford Bronco. Um, mm -hmm. So that was my first car, a Red Tempo. So, are you still a Ford guy? Uh, no, um, I do like them, but my wife and I drive um, some nice Mercedes. Okay, good. Well, I'm I'm glad to see that that you that you moved on from all that, but. Um, I just, I got, I got to thank you for, for taking the time today. I know you've, I know you've got a lot going on. Uh, we, we enjoy listening to the, to the broadcast and we got a lot of, uh, a lot of folks that were on your Fox team while you were with, with the, with the group, uh, on, on the baseball side and, and that said to say hellos, specifically Chris Myers. He, he helped me come up with a lot of the, the pressing hard questions for, for this interview as, as we prepped yesterday. So, um, Joe, thanks for thanks for taking the time. We appreciate you uh, supporting our sport, and and we'll be we'll be watching the progression of the year in baseball. Well, Kevin, thank you, and please say hi to everyone, and please wish your son good luck this weekend. I know he's going to be, you know, you're going to be announcing for him soon, and that's going to be what a thrill for you. Well, I appreciate it, Joe, and we appreciate every what everybody watching Kevin Harvick's Happy Hour presented by NASCAR on Fox. Follow us on YouTube or anywhere else that's. Uh, uh, you, you catch your uh, podcasts. Follow us on social at Happy Harvick Pod, anywhere you use social media. Thanks for watching.